The American poet Robert Frost was the first American poet to enjoy the status that was going to be officially, eventually, Poet Laureate of America. But he did enjoy that status and certainly was one who deserved to have achieved it. He was born in 1875 and as a young man he spent some years in England coming under the influence of poets such as Edward Thomas. He absolutely came nowhere near the modernist movement. His poetry was always on rural themes. His poetry was simple but not commonplace. He had a truly individual voice and a marvellous sense of rhythm. I agree with the French poet Jacques Reda who believes, as I do, that rhythm is the essential heartbeat of poetry. It's not rhyme, it's not metre. I've never been into measuring metrics, but there is a kind of vision in Robert Frost. The only English poet when it comes anywhere near him in modern times, possibly, is Norman Nicholson, a poet whose work sadly has more or less slipped from public view. Um, in F. O. Matheson's Oxford book of American verse, Frost is given a very, very generous um, selection of pages, and I think this is very well justified. I'll begin by reading his most famous poem, often included in anthologies of poems for children, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely deep and dark but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. I think there is in that poem a wonderful sense of serenity, of peace, and of an essential harmony between man and nature. And it is this quality that I've always valued I value it in Wordsworth. I value it most especially, I think, in Emily Bronte. Although the harsh landscape in winter of Haworth is indeed harsh, there is a serene beauty there in the summer and in the autumn. There are poets like Carl Sandburg who are essentially city poets and Hart Crane. But I think of poets who wrote about nature, none writes as well, and so frequently as well, as Robert Frost. He's absolutely not a one-poem poet, though that particular poem is the one he is most known for. Um, when he writes about the rural world he, he lived in, he writes as though, not as a tourist, not as a spectator, but someone writing about a life he's actually participated in and grown old by the side of. His other most famous poem is After Apple Picking, a poem that I read and taught and used frequently as a teaching poem. The rhythm here is absolutely superb. After apple picking. 
my long two pointed ladders sticking through a tree toward heaven still and there's a barrel that I didn't fill beside it and there may be two or three apples I didn't pick upon some bough but I am done with apple picking now essence of winter sleep is on the night the scent of apples I am drowsing off I cannot rub the strangeness from my sight I got from looking through a pane of glass I skimmed this morning from the drinking trough and held against the world of hoary grass it melted and I let it fall and break but I was well upon my way to sleep before it fell and I could tell what for my dreaming was about to tell magnified apples appear and disappear stem end and blossom end and every fleck of russet showing clear my instep arch not only keeps the ache it keeps the pressure of a ladder round i feel the ladder sway as the boughs bend and i keep hearing from the cellar bin the rumbling sound of load on loads of apples coming in but i have had too much of apple picking i am overtired of the great harvest i myself desired there were ten thousand fruit to touch cherish in hand lift down and not let fall for all that struck the earth no matter if not bruised or spiked with stubble went surely to the cider apple heap as of no worth one can see what will trouble this sleep of mine whatever sleep it is were he not gone the woodchuck could say whether it's like his long sleep as i describe it coming on or just some human sleep the art i think of frost is in this seeming casualness but this seeming casualness marks an immense devotion to his art form in that particular poem the kind of making a statement and then denying the statement and the poet himself is there as a subject but a subject which merges with the background and then re-emerges as the poet speaking with an absolutely individual voice frost has that voice no one i think has successfully imitated him he has had no particular critical following books have been written about him his great sadness that was that one of his children suffered from a lifelong very severe mental illness and this had a disastrous effect on frost it was something he found incredibly difficult to deal with um, another of his most successful poems which is quite a long poem is the death of the hired man and this is taken from the point of view of a woman whose husband a successful farmer takes on casual labor and this is the story of the life and death of one of these men the death of the hired man mary sat musing on the lamp flame at the table waiting for warren when she heard his step she ran on tiptoe down the darkened passage to meet him in the doorway with the news and put him on his guard silas is back she pushed him outward with her through the door and shut it after her be kind she said she took the market things from warren's arms and set them on the porch then drew him down to sit beside her on the wooden steps when was i ever anything but kind to him 
but I'll not have the fellow back, he said. I told him so last haying, didn't I? If he left then, I said, that ended it. What good is he? Who else will harbour him, at his age, for the little he can do? What help he is, there's no depending on. Off he goes always when I need him most. He thinks he ought to earn a little pay, enough at least to buy tobacco with, so he won't have to beg and be beholden. All right, I say. I can't afford to pay any fixed wages, though I wish I could. Someone else can. Then someone else will have to. I shouldn't mind his bettering himself, if that was what it was. You can be certain, when he begins like that, there's someone at him trying to coax him off with pocket money. In haying time, when any help is scarce. In winter he comes back to us. I'm done. Shh! Not so loud. He'll hear you, Mary said. I want to, him to. He'll have to, soon or late. He's worn out. He's asleep beside the stove. When I came up from Rose, I found him here, huddled against the barn door, fast asleep. A miserable sight, and frightening too. You needn't smile. I didn't recognise him. I wasn't looking for him. And he's changed. Wait till you see. Where did you say he's been? He didn't say. I dragged him to the house and gave him tea and tried to make him smoke. I tried to make him talk about his travels. Nothing would do. He just kept nodding off. What did he say? Did he say anything? But little. Anything? Mary, confess. He said he'd come to ditch the meadow for me. Warren? But did he? I just want to know. Of course he did. What would you have him say? Surely you wouldn't grudge the poor old man some humble way to save his self-respect. He added, if you really care to know, he meant to clear the upper pasture too. That sounds like something you have heard before, Warren. I wish you could have heard the way he jumbled everything. I stopped to look two or three times. He made me feel so queer to see if he was talking in his sleep. He ran on Harold Wilson, you remember? The boy you had in haying four years since. He'd finished school and teaching in his college. Silas declares you will have to get him back. He says they make two will make a team for work. Between them, they will lay this farm as smooth, the way he mixed with that in with other things. He thinks young Wilson a likely lad, though daft on education. You know how they fought all through July under the blazing sun. Silas up on the cart to build the load, Harold along, beside to pitch it on. Yes, I took care to keep well out of earshot. Well, those days trouble Silas like a dream. You wouldn't think they would. How some things linger. Harold's young college boy's assurance piqued him. After so many years, he still keeps finding good arguments he sees he might have used. I sympathise. I know just how it feels to think of the right thing to say too late. Harold's associated in his mind with Latin. He asked me what he thought of Harold saying he studied Latin like the violin, because he liked it. That's an argument. He said he couldn't make the boy believe he could find water with a hazel prong, which showed how much good school had ever done him. He wanted to go over that. But most of all, he thinks, if he could have another chance to teach him how to build a load of hay. I know, that's Silas. One accomplishment. He bundles every forkful in its place and tags and numbers it for future reference so he can find and easily dislodge it in the unloading. Silas does that well. He takes it out in bunches like big birds' nests. 
You'll never see him standing on the hay. He's trying to lift, straining to lift himself. He thinks if he could teach him that he'd be some good perhaps to someone in the world. He hates to see a boy the fool of books. Poor Silas. So concerned for other folk and nothing to look backward with pride and nothing to look forward to with hope. So now and never any different. Part of a moon was falling down the west, digging the whole sky with it to the hills, its light pouring softly in her lap. She saw it and spread her apron to it. She put out her hand among the harp-like morning glory strings, taut with the dew from garden bed to eaves, as if she played, unheard, some tenderness that wrought on him beside her in the night. Warren, she said, he has come home to die. You needn't be afraid he'll leave you this time. Home? he mocked gently. What else but home? It all depends on what you mean by home. Of course, he's nothing to us any more than was the hound that came a stranger to us out of the woods worn out upon the trail. Home is the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. I should have called something you somehow haven't to deserve. Warren leaned out and took a step or two, picked up a little stick and brought it back and broke it in his hand and tossed it by. Silas has a better claim on us, you think, than on his brother. Thirteen little miles as the road winds would bring him to his door. Silas has walked that far, no doubt, today. Why didn't he go there? His brother's rich, a somebody, director in the bank. He never told us that. We know it, though. I think his brother ought to help, of course. I'll see to that, if there is need. He ought of right to take him in, and might be willing to. He may be better than appearances, but have some pity on Silas. Do you think if he had any pride in claiming kin, or anything he looked for from his brother, he'd keep so still about him all this time? I wonder what's between them. I can tell you, Silas is what he is. We wouldn't mind him, but... Just the kind that kinfolk can't abide. He never did a thing so very bad. He don't know why he isn't quite as good as anybody. Worthless though he is, he wouldn't be made ashamed to please his brother. I can't think Si ever hurt anyone. No, but he hurt my heart the way he lay and rolled his head on the sharp-edged chair back. He wouldn't let me put him on the lounge. You must go in and see what you can do. I made the bed up for him there tonight. You'd be surprised at him. How much he's broken. His working days are done, I'm sure of it. I'd not be in a hurry to say that. I haven't been. Go, look, see for yourself. But Warren, please remember how it is. He's come to help you ditch the meadow. He has a plan. You mustn't laugh at him. He may not speak of it, and then he may. I'll sit and see if that small sailing cloud will hit or miss the moon. It hit the moon. Then there were th three there, making a dim row, the moon, the silver cloud, and she. Warren returned too late it seemed to her, slipped to her side, caught of her hand and waited. Warren, she questioned, dead, was all he answered. I think that poem is a magnificent tragic poem. It's a magnificent narrative poem. And it's a magnificent poem of a dialogue. Many poets have tried to write extended poems 
but they tend, and I find this particularly with heart cranes, the bridge. After a few lines, they become boring, they become repetitive, and you end up sitting putting the, the page down. But I think with that poem, Robert Frost was at his absolute best. He captured the huge tragedy of the millions and millions of itinerant workers, black and white, who drifted across the American plains, working a farm here, working a farm there, moving along from season to season, somehow, somewhere, getting through winter, or perhaps not. But there is in Frost, in that poem, a kind of philosophical acceptance, not just of the casual cruelty of Silas's rich banker brother, but of the equally devoted casual kindness of the farmer and his wife, who actually looked after him in the hours before his death. I think that is a wonderful poem, and I think that Robert Frost is a poet who is sadly, certainly, outside America, gathering dust. He's a wonderful poet to teach, whether you're talking to children or to students, or simply reading for the sheer enjoyment of reading. I've never heard him read. I don't know whether there are any recordings of him. Perhaps there may be somewhere. But certainly, he's a poem you can read silently. He's a poem whose work you can read aloud. But he's never a poet who becomes boring and he never repeats himself. He never uses clichés. His words are truly newly minted and his voice is truly individual.